Uh, it's exciting. Welcome, uh, welcome to the, the first talk after the keynotes. Um, uh, as, as always, there's, uh, there's fun to be had for everybody. Uh, what did I call this darn thing? Sweet. Uh, Resolution-wise, how is that? That's probably a little bit small, right? Let's make that a little bigger. Uh, cool. So, um, oh, let me get set up in the other one. Uh, let's go ahead and make this dark for you. Um, sorry for the. There we go. That will make the switching less panic inducing. Cool. So, uh, welcome. Thank you. Sorry for the delay. Uh, that'll make the fact that there's no way that I can get through this content in the allotted amount of time uh, even more fun. Uh, so uh, I hope nobody has anywhere to be because this is going to take me at least a year. Anyway, so uh, this is going to be a, a, a talk about uh, consuming multiple OpenStack clouds um, uh, easily because I do it all the time and I find it very easy. Uh, but people tell me that, wow, that seems complicated. And it turns out it's not. So I'm going to hopefully tell you everything you've ever wanted to know. I will, in fact, tell you more than you've ever wanted to know, uh, and after this, hopefully, you should want to kill me. Um, but uh, but that's, just, that's just how life is. So a uh, quick introduction. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Monty. Uh, I work on the OpenStack Infra core team. Uh, I also uh, uh, work uh, for the, the fine folks at Rack, uh, excuse me, at uh, Red Hat. Wow, that is, I keep doing that at OpenStack summits. I have more than what, last time it was I was trying to actually reference Rackspace and called them Red Hat anyway. So I uh, don't know why that is, especially since I work for Red Hat. Uh, you'd think I would know the name of that company, but uh, clearly I don't know how to talk. Uh, so anyway, uh, for the purpose of this talk, the important piece is the InfraCore part, because that's where most of this comes from. Uh, I am Mordred on IRC and Freenode, uh, and you can also tweet uh, angry uh, uh, pain at me uh, anytime on Twitter, and I will gladly ignore you, um, because you know nobody needs that kind of anger in their life. Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, the Shade Library, which is a library that I wrote uh, along with some other people. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, a, a task and end user oriented Python library. So it is not a Python library that exposes the OpenStack REST APIs. If you would like a library that does that, the OpenStack SDK project uh, is an excellent project that is oriented around uh, that as a, as, a, as a concept. That is not what this does. Uh, Shade abstracts deployer differences. So we've uh, granted our deployer community an immense amount of flexibility in how to deploy their clouds, and that's wonderful. It, it gives them the ability to express uh, themselves and, and to try and meet their customers' needs. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, we, we've done that in such a way in some places that it makes it hard for uh, users to consume those clouds. Uh, silly us. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so Shade is designed uh, to abstract those problems and work around them for you. Uh, it's designed to be multi-cloud from the beginning. Uh, when we started writing this, we were already consuming, I think, either three or four different clouds simultaneously uh, in, in our automation. So uh, that was a really important <laughs> feature for us. Uh, it, it would not be useful uh, if it hadn't been designed with that in mind. Uh, hopefully it's simple to use. I think it is. Uh, but I also um, wrote it, so you know, I, I, might be, I might be missing something. Uh, I might have too much context. Uh, it's also designed for massive scale. We use it inside of Infra's node pool. Um, uh, system, which is the thing that, that manages all of the test nodes for, uh, for the OpenStack uh, CI infrastructure. This is different than the, the, the pool of Kubernetes nodes uh, that were talked about in the keynote this morning. Um, uh, it turns out there's only so many names for a thing that creates pools of nodes, so, you know, yay. Uh, uh, but in, in our particular in instance, we use uh, this library behind a system that spins up and destroys around 20,000 VMs a day. Um, uh, so so we're, we're pretty confident uh, that it can, it can handle the scale. Um, there are some things I will not talk about in this talk. There's another Shade talk tomorrow that's a little bit more about theory and design, um, uh, where I will, I will go into some of the optional advanced features uh, for, for high-scale stuff. They're, they're weird, and you shouldn't think about them un unless you actually need to, um, uh, but they, they do exist. Um, and as I mentioned, it, it, it came out of node pool, then we, we turned it into a library because we were also starting to work on the, Ansible, the OpenStack support in Ansible and realized that we needed the same, the same things we'd already written in node pool and like, wow, this clearly needs to be a library so that we don't have to duplicate all of this logic again. Um, and thus, Shade was born. Uh, so it is free software. Uh, you can get it from, uh, from Git in the OpenStack uh, Git repositories. Uh, you can, we can talk about it on the OpenStack dev list. Uh, we also have a channel uh, on IRC, OpenStack-Shade, uh, as you might expect. 
Um, it came out of the infra group, but it is now actually a, an official uh, OpenStack project uh, of, its, of its own, uh, because that's really important to everybody. Um, incidentally, this talk is also free software. Uh, it was written for a piece of software called Presenti, uh, which is a console-based uh, presentation uh, software that takes uh, uh, restructured text files as input. Um, so this, uh, this, the, the source for this talk is actually in now the shade documentation directory as part of the shade documentation. Uh, which uh, I just realized as sort of working on this that that was a possibility, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. That's a really cool. Uh, that's a really cool option to be able to do that, and we've come up with a couple of improvements in that workflow that we'll make. But uh, so there may even be a meta talk at some point about giving talks that are also part of your documentation, uh, because that was definitely a path we should all go down. Uh, I, I'm mentioning some paths some local paths to example files and stuff like that in the talk. Uh, please don't consider those to be written in stone. Like, go look for them or whatever if you're gonna check out this uh, later on. But since this is the, the first presentation that I put into Shade's source tree, uh, I, I may need to reorganize it as we figure out what we do with maybe five or six presentations or, or whatever. So um, the, the things will be here and this will stick around, but you know, I might move it. So, um, uh, so what, oh, and that's a slide that's a response to a slide that isn't there anymore. So anyway, so this is a complete example uh, of creating a server uh, on, uh, on a Dev1 Jesse node uh, on three different clouds. Um, uh, this is all you have to do, it's the whole thing. Uh, this is, is completely functional. I'm not going to, I'm gonna run a, because I'm stupid, uh, I'm going to run a bunch of scripts during this talk and show them to you that all are going to talk to live public clouds. Uh, that, of course, always works perfectly. So, um, especially on conference Wi-Fi. I'm not gonna run this one because one of the things it does in the middle is it uploads an, an, an image <laughs> to the cloud, and I don't think that trying to upload a, an entire operating system image uh, to a public cloud over conference Wi-Fi is a good idea. So, just, this is basically here as a, here's, here's, a, here's a simple script that does all of the things across multiple clouds uh, without uh, a whole heck of a lot of uh, of divergent logic other than here's the list of clouds and regions. Uh, and that'll work. I will talk about that in more detail in a second. Uh, before I talk about the specifics of that script, uh, I wanna run through some terminology. I'm gonna try and do it quickly. If you can't follow it, that's fine. Uh, you, you most of the, for the most part, you don't need to know any of it. Uh, but a quick overview I think is really helpful, especially there's some terms in here that, that people in the community in general get confused about, especially as they relate to auth. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna do those. If you're a Keystone dev in here, if I get a couple of these things wrong, just, just let it go, it's fine. Um, so, uh, so some terminology, there's a few things. Uh, clouds, uh, that, can, that, can get really, that can get questionable in of itself. Uh, we, we could get, sit, probably go to a bar and talk for two hours on, on the definition of that. For, for, this, for these purposes, we're essentially talking about uh, an installation of OpenStack that ha ha it, will, it will have one or more regions, but it's a, it's a logical construct run by some people, right? It probably has a name. You could probably point your finger at it and be like, I'm gonna use that cloud over there. That's a cloud, right? Inside of that cloud, there may be one or more regions. In OpenStack, a region is essentially a completely independent installation of OpenStack that only shares being registered into the same Keystone service catalog. Uh, other, than the, other than Keystone, OpenStack regions share absolutely nothing and are not aware that they're even in a region, like it's, it's not a construct past the Keystone level. Um, there's a word that doesn't really come up, but I wanna point out that there's a, a, there's a thing we're missing a word for. I'm gonna call it a patron for, for right now. Uh, and that's the human who may have an, a, an account on, on a cloud, right? We have, we have users, but a user is, a, is an object inside of Keystone that describes a, an account that can connect and do things over, over the API or, or whatnot. Um, a, a, a human uh, may manage more, one or more of those things and, and may have one or more projects or, or whatever. So somewhere in here there's a human. Humans are people that get billed, users are things that interact with, uh, with clouds. In a lot of cases, it's a one-to-one -one relationship, but, but it is possible for it not to be exactly the same. Um, a user is, a, is an account, as I mentioned, in a cloud. A project is a, is, a, is a collection of cloud resources. All of your cloud resources go into a project. They, they are owned, in a, literally all of them, they go into a project, it is not a, it, it gets lumped in with our authentication, but it's, it's the container for resources. And then a domain, which not everybody interacts with all the time, uh, is, is a collection of users and projects for namespacing purposes, right? So a, project, a domain can have more than one 
Uh, so a cloud can have one or more regions, a patron can have one or more users, a patron can have one or more projects, it turns out. A cloud has one or more domains. All clouds have at least one domain. It's called default uh, if it only has one, uh, and the cloud operator has not decided to do anything with domains. Um, uh, uh, in some clouds, each patron has their own domain. And in this context, giving a, a patron of a cloud the ability to create their own users and projects uh, is empowered by handing them a, a domain with domain admin uh, credentials on it. Uh, I recommend to all of you who are deploying clouds, please deploy your cloud in that manner uh, because it, uh, it exposes some features uh, that people keep asking us to add to OpenStack that are already there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Just, it would be great. Like, that was added, like, three or four years ago, and people keep asking us to add the support to do that. Um, uh, so please start giving people their own domains and let them create users and projects as, as a normal user of the, of the cloud. Um, uh, for that matter, while I'm on this rant, um, especially in the organizations where the authentication is some sort of uh, federated, you know, you're federated with the corporate LDAP system or some sort of external system, those external systems are describing the patron, right? They're describing the human who has a relationship with the, the, the surrounding entity. Um, that human may still want to create some API-only user accounts that they use, because you don't really want to do, like, a SAML uh, single sign-on dance every time you want to make an API call. That would make automation scripts impossible. Uh, uh, so, so just these are great things. Uh, anyway, every user's in a uh, inner domain, a project's inner domain, and a user has one or more pro uh, roles on a project. But this is not a talk about Keystone, so I'm going to talk faster now. Um, there, we talked to the cloud over HTTP, um, and uh, those those HTTP interactions are authenticated via Keystone. Um, authentication uh, returns a token, um, and essentially that authenticated HTTP session uh, is shared across the region. Right, so you can use that same authenticated HTTP session to talk to all of the services within a region. You are not guaranteed to be able to do that in a different region. Um, uh, so I'm saying all of this because essentially a, a cloud region, right, like the, 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 the combination of a cloud and a region is the fundamental uh, unit of talking to, to any OpenStack cloud. Uh, even if the cloud only has one region, you're talking to that region. Like, you, you must have a cloud and a region to, to talk to anything. Um, and so this is sort of the, the unit that we uh, that we instantiate objects at. Uh, so you'll be creating a connection object for a region and then doing things on it. Um, a cloud has a service catalog. Uh, that service catalog should, unless you're a naughty, naughty person, uh, that service catalog should contain all of the endpoints of all of the services in all of the regions for the cloud. And if you get the service catalog in any region, it should show you all of the services in the other regions as well. If you're not doing yours that way, please change your cloud to do it that way, because that is the way that makes everybody uh, be able to do things well. Um, uh, and as I said, a region is completely autonomous. Um, so just a little bit more. Uh, the, and I mentioned this already, so I'm not going to do the, all of the bullet points here. But essentially, if you have multiple domains, projects and, and user names are only unique within a region. Um, and so as you're expressing your authentication in, in config file, which I'll show you in just a second, um, there, people get, this is one of the main points that people get confused on. Um, if you are in a Keystone v3 domain-enabled cloud, uh, and you want to express your config of your user and your project by their names, so username and project name, you must include domain information. Otherwise, it has no idea in what domain you're asking for a named user or project. If, on the other hand, you express your user and project information by ID, because every user and project has both a name and an ID, uh, IDs are unique because they're, a, they're, a, they're a, a hash, right? They're a, a SHA, whatever. Or your, they're a UID. So, so those, are, those are actually unique, and you do not need to express domain information if you are in either, whether it's v2 or v3, if you're, if you're doing it by ID. So ID is, is actually the, the, the easier way to deal with it, no matter which auth version you are. But also IDs are extremely difficult to think of when you're looking at a config file, and you're like, am I connecting to the right project? Am I going to create, am I going to create these resources and delete these resources in the correct bucket? Oh, nope. Oh, because I don't know how to memorize UUIDs. Um, so, so I, I do recommend using names and just adding the domain information. Um, so anyway, if that's all a confusing mess, uh, that's fine. Uh, we're not going to talk about it very much more. And hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll take care of guiding you in your use of things uh, with appropriate error messages and whatnot. But a little bit of the background on, on why you need to, to 
provide certain pieces of information in certain places uh, I, I thought would be a little bit helpful. Um, so there's essentially authentication uh, per cloud. You're saying, hey, here's my user account. I have authentication information. This is how I authenticate to the cloud. Um, and then that cloud may have one or more regions which before you want to do some operations, you need to, to tell the library, I want to authenticate to this cloud and then operate in, in this region over here. So they're, they're selectors in a lot of ways. So you configure authentication per cloud and then you're gonna select the config that you want to use by cloud and region. Uh, you do all of this in a, in a, in a file called clouds.yaml. Some of you may have uh, in the past used an OpenRC file which sets some environment variables. Great, you can still do that. I recommend not uh, because the whole topic here is dealing with multiple clouds. And uh, if you're gonna do OpenRC files, then you've gotta you know, have a directory of OpenRC files and source one. And, and you really need to make sure that each file has like some unset lines in it uh, that will, will unset previous ones because otherwise you'll like persist settings for one cloud over into another cloud and, and things will get confused and it'll be like, you can't log in. You're like, but I logged in with that yesterday. Why is this broken? Just stop using the OpenRC files. They're, they're, uh, they were great in their day. Uh, but you should use the clouds.yaml file. They are supported by uh, Shade, uh, which means they're supported by the OpenStack Ansible modules. Uh, the, the Salt people are also uh, working on uh, adopting Shade as a backend, so that they should be, uh, uh, clouds.yaml file should be supported there. It's also supported by Python OpenStack client. Uh, so, so basically you're, and, and uh, the OpenStack SDK. So all of the things that you're, you should be using in a general basis we can talk later about other language ecosystems. That's a to-do list item that I hope to have fixed in the next month or so. Um, but I don't want to say that it works today because it doesn't. Um, but in general, this is, this is the sort of path forward. We also just added a, a patch to Horizon uh, in this cycle to provide you a clouds.yaml file out of, out of Horizon just like it today can provide you an OpenRC file. So uh, we're trying to get the tooling out so that it's really easy for you to ingest configs of, of clouds. Uh, so it can go in your home directory in, uh, in dot config slash OpenStack slash clouds.yaml. You can also install it system-wide, uh, depending on what your use of a particular system is and how it's using. You can stick a config file in, in Etsy uh, OpenStack clouds.yaml. Be careful if you're sticking passwords in there, obviously, to password pr to, to protect it uh, so that the wrong people don't get it. Uh, but those are two choices, and you can, that's, that's your call as to where you want to stick your config file. Um, if there is information both in your home directory and in Etsy, your home directory wins, uh, because that's the more specific of the two. Uh, you can read full documentation on clouds.yaml. I say full, I'm writing a whole bunch more documentation right now, because last time I talked to the other language ecosystems, they're like, what the hell are you doing in this file? And I'm like, well, I know what it's doing. Um, so we're trying to document that. Uh, but uh, it, as part of the open OS client config, library is the one that implements all of the clouds.yaml config processing, and so that's where the documentation for that is. Uh, if you're on Mac or Windows, uh, uh, tilde.config OpenStack and Etsy OpenStack aren't actually the, the uh, strictly the correct places to stick uh, config files, um, so Shade will look for files in the appropriate location for that operating system. Uh, in OS X, that's uh, apparently, uh, people tell me library applications support OpenStack, uh, and uh, on Windows, it's uh, C colon backslash users, your username, uh, app data, local, open stack, open stack. So um, don't ask me why there's two open stacks. I think it has something to do with vendor and then project. Uh, but anyway, those are, those are there and are supported. Um, uh, and uh, we actually use a library that knows how to find things, which is the reason. I did not pick those locations. Those are the right locations. If you don't like them, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, so in, inside of the config, there's kind of two different types of config. Again, a lot of this is things in the general case you don't have to worry about, but in the slightly more expanded case you do. Um, there's things we call profiles, which are descriptions of a cloud. Um, so a profile describes inherent qualities. So like Rackspace's public cloud has a profile that's built into to OS client config, and it, it has some information about the cloud, which is true for everyone, right? The, the, the added information does not change regardless of, of your user preferences. And then there is actually your configuration for using that cloud, which is your authentication information and, and potentially some other preferences you have about how you want to, to consume that cloud. Uh, uh, and things like that. I apologize for the fact that uh, the cloud config is uh, known as, the word cloud, it's just, I'm out of words, I'm sorry. Um, it, it, in general, doesn't wind up being terribly confusing and, and 
other than when you're ex describing the concept, uh, you're overloading the terms, but in general usage, th it, the things do the things you expect them to do. Uh, I mentioned environment variables. You can use environment variables. They, they pass through appropriately, so if you have a bunch of OS underscore environment variables, they will be processed and slurped up and put into a cloud definition that is called envvars. Um, uh, so when you refer to a cloud by name, you can refer to the envvars cloud if you had set some environment variables, and that will be that cloud. Uh, it, we do not overlay environment variables on top of a given config, because that, it turns out, is always confusing, and nobody can ever expect what is going to be the right thing. Um, uh, and so we, we decided to stick them in there. Um, you can set the, the environment variables OS cloud and OS region name to be default values for selecting the cloud and region. So if you set those two environment variables, Shade will use them as a default, uh, and, uh, and you don't have to specify those in your, in your script or your, your code or whatever. Um, OK, so that's way too much talking. Uh, sorry, there's no code on screen. There's no examples that are clearly going to fail because of content's Wi-Fi. Uh, so <laughs> let's, let's, let's show a little bit of that. So this is a basic clouds.yaml um, for the example code that I've, I've got in here. What's the first piece of one? It's going to be on three slides. Uh, uh, so this is a config for a cloud that I have named my city cloud. Uh, uh, it references a, a, a well-known named profile uh, that refers to a cloud called city cloud. Actually, in my real clouds.yaml, uh, I, both of these, it's just pro city cloud, profile city cloud. But like, to make it clear that one is the name of, that you're going to refer to this configuration as, and the other one is the name of the cloud that you're talking to, uh, I've renamed them. Um, and there's my auth, inf uh, the auth information. The auth information goes into a, a, a dictionary that is not at the top level. This is on purpose, and it is actually an implementation detail from the Ansible modules. So there is a little bit of, of <laughs> designing this based on what was needed to be able to pass things appropriately. Um, but it turns out, even though a lot of clients don't implement this, Keystone authentication is fully pluggable. Um, and the, the parameters that you pass into Keystone, auth Keystone authentication are completely variable based on the plugin. So you can't do parameter validation in a general way on, on things that we could otherwise validate. So we keep auth as an opaque dictionary, because the only thing that knows how to, to validate it is the authentication plugin you're going to pass it to in the first place. Um, that's too much explanation for why that is. But I bring that up because we, we get problems from people that will that will stick things up at the, at the top level uh, or stick other pieces of config information into the auth dict. The auth dict is just the parameters to the auth plugin, so username, password, auth URL, et cetera. Um, you may have noticed that there is no password in this auth information, which makes it very bad auth information. Uh, it's not going to authenticate very well without a password. Um, uh, so, uh, and I, I extracted that to point out there is also an optional feature. In my actual clouds.yaml, my passwords are all in there. It's fine. Um, but in, if, if you wanted to be a little bit uh, more squirrely about things, you can stick just the, you can stick anything you want to in another call, file called secure.yaml that will also get read and overlaid on top of the settings that it finds in the, uh, in the, in the clouds.yaml. So the, the most sane reason you would ever want to do that is that you want to have one file with just your passwords in it that's protected more strictly, and then another file that's readable that more people can see so they can understand what's going on. Um, uh, that's why uh, I added that feature, and I don't use it myself, so, but it's there if you want to use it. Uh, so here's an example, secure.yaml. Um, you'll notice this, this cloud here is named MyCityCloud, so in the secure.yaml, the cloud is also named MyCityCloud and has an auth dict with a password in it. So those will get combined together, and everything will just work. Um, you can provide additional information into this config other than just uh, the, the, uh, your authentication information. Uh, in this particular case, this is a, a, a definition for uh, a, a configuration for Vexos, which is another public cloud. Um, in this, I'm telling it that I want to use version three of the, uh, of the identity API, um, regardless of kind of what detection or, or, or whatever it finds. Uh, and I want to use that as my image endpoint. I want to ignore whatever's in the service catalog, and I want to use that one uh, for image operations. Uh, it's actually not strictly necessary on, on Vexhost. The, the code will find v2 of the API in, in Vexhost fine, uh, but for, uh, for sake of, of pointing out when you need that kind of escape hatch, uh, you can do it in this way. Uh, and then uh, standard auth things. You see here that I've expressed uh, that I'm going to use uh, the, the domain ID for my user and my project are both default uh, 
yes, do default is both the name and the ID of the default domain. Um, yeah, so. Um, so this is a much more complicated example for the third cloud that's going to be in the in the in the demo, um, and that is uh, uh, my my connection to Internap, uh, which is yet another public cloud. Uh, you'll hear me saying the words yet another public cloud a little bit. Um, so in this one, I'm actually not using a. There is an Internap profile that's that's defined in, in the in the library, uh, but I decided for sake of example to show you do not have to reference a pre-existing cloud profile. You can put all of the information directly in this. One of the reasons for the profiles is that information doesn't change and it's very repetitive, so there's no need for you to have to manage it. I can manage it fine for you and cut new releases of, of OS client config and, and it's all up to date. Um, but if you have things or maybe you're using a private cloud that I don't publish because it's a private cloud, uh, you, you may need to put in uh, some of this information. Uh, incidentally, you can also make a uh, an additional, and it's not included in this talk because we start to get into the weeds, um, not like we already aren't already there, uh, but you, you could actually, if you wanted to, make a profile definition today and distribute it to your users for them to install on their systems in well-known locations, and, and it will find that. So you could have a locally defined profile for your private cloud, hand that to your users, and then it would have all of the appropriate information. We also have a proposal that I will be talking about tomorrow afternoon uh, in a session called Deploy Exposing Deployer Differences Without Death, death uh, to, uh, to start having the clouds be able to provide the profile directly from an endpoint. Uh, so that so that all of this of there's magic files that Monty is maintaining in the corner uh, can stop be magic that I'm maintaining and just be sort of a standard thing that we know is documented and people can count on. Um, but that's again that uh, that's a talk tomorrow uh, afternoon in the forum. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm expressing an identity API version. Uh, I'm I'm telling it that this cloud doesn't have floating IPs because I know that right now. Shade will figure that out. Um, of its own free will, but it takes a few additional API calls. And in this case, I know this cloud doesn't have floating IPs, so I'm just telling it this doesn't have floating IPs. Uh, so don't bother trying to look for them, please. Uh, and that will that will save some introspection uh, in some of the interactions. Um, also, you're seeing that we've got a a, a list of of regions uh, that have some values. Regions. You can do this for any values that exist. Uh, any of the values can be per region, or they can be global for the cloud. Um, in this particular case, there's an interesting characteristic at Internap uh, that they, when you create, when you as as a patron create a new account, uh, they they you know spin you up a, a, a user and a, and a project in the cloud, and they they provision for you your very own public network and private network, and they, and they give them to you. Sadly, there is no way in the Neutron API to tell that that public network is a public network. Uh, it is impossible. Uh, there is a feature on Neutron networks uh, called, uh, or there's a, a property called router external. That does not mean router, that does not mean this uh, routes things externally. Uh, as we found out with the fine folks at Internet, actually, I was like, hey, so I've got this public network and it doesn't have router external true. Could you set that? Turns out, uh, that makes the, the network visible to all of the other users of the cloud, although they still can't connect to it. Uh, <laughs> so it, 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 it broke a bunch of their users who weren't me, and so they had to revert that real quickly. Uh, but I, I do appreciate them uh, helping us learn this uh, about this. Uh, it, it's, it's, just, it's, it's physically impossible to know this from the Neutron API at the moment. So we just started here. We've got a couple of pieces of metadata. If you find yourself in a, in a similar weird hole, uh, one, we, our general philosophy is we don't think you should have to uh, configure anything, really. You should just be able to give it off and everything should go. If there's cases like this where it's just not possible to figure it out, uh, we want to make sure that there's, a, there's a, a flag somewhere that you can go and say, no, this is really what's happening, and, and be able to move on with your, with your life. Uh, so in this case, we're essentially annotating these networks. We're saying this network routes packets externally, this other network uh, uh, does not. Uh, and then finally, this, the default interface true there is, so there's two networks that show up in my, in my, uh, in my project. So when I'm going to go create a server, uh, Nova's going to expect me in this case to tell it which network I want to create the server on. That's fair. Uh, I, I know, b based on my usage patterns, that I'm always going to want to create servers on that public one because just of the way that I do things. Uh, so I've got a flag in here that I can set. It's optional. If you don't set it, just whenever you're doing a create server, you'll have to, in this cloud, say, hey, I, you know, uh, I, want to, I want to use this network or this other network or both networks or, or whatever, uh, which are all fine things. So 
blah, 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 config, config, config. So if you have a cloud.yaml that's lovingly set up uh, uh, in, in such a way, uh, you, can, you can actually run the script, which I told you that I wasn't going to run. But I'll run a different version of it in a second. Uh, but I'm going to walk through it real quick. Um, uh, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but uh, real quickly, um, we're going to import the library. Step one, import library. Um, uh, step two is uh, initialize logging. So Shade uses Python logging for, for things. Uh, it, it's sort of the full normal Python logging system. So as a person writing an application, you can uh, configure that logging to do whatever it is you want to do. It's possible you don't want to configure the Python logging system uh, to do specific things. You would like to just kind of have it do whatever. Uh, so in this case, we've got you a, a, a simple helper method uh, uh, called simple logging. It's not very flexible. Uh, it, has, it has three options. It will do some amount of logging setup. Uh, the, sort of the basic of this is that it squelches some meaningless warnings from some, from some sub-libraries that are uh, annoying to you and you can't do anything about. Uh, so we make them go away because you, you can't action them. Uh, and I don't believe that warnings that the user can't do anything about are useful. Um, uh, uh, thank you, subject alt name warning in, in requests. Uh, uh, I, I can't fix the cloud I'm connecting to. It doesn't have a subject alt name. That's just what it is. Uh, sorry, rant. Uh, so it does some easy defaults like that. You can also pass it debug equals true or HTTP debug equals true. Uh, these are usually how I'm, I'm doing things. Uh, and these will either print out some amount of debug information about what's going on or actually the, the full on HTTP uh, interaction tracing. Uh, so if you really want to see what's going on, uh, it'll, it'll do that. Um, uh, so as a, as a quick example, uh, oh, I should probably make this bigger too. Um, so I've got this, oh, I can't type it, damn it. Um, this would be great, you guys get to see me. Uh, so running a, a script with debug logging on will show you things like this. So that went and, uh, and did a, an, an image list on the, on the thing, so it's, uh, uh, there's, there's sort of two different, diff two different pieces in here, but you did the one ac operation that's telling you that it's going to run it, and then it ran it, and how long it took. Uh, it's also, in this case, because we've configured the request IDs logger to log request IDs, uh, it's, it's actually logging the request ID that that particular interaction took. Um, uh, and uh, it actually did it uh, twice, oh, because there's, a, because there's pagination in the, in the Glance API. So if you're going to get the image list, it turns out sometimes that takes more than one call, shows you all of those things. Uh, so great, isn't that very exciting? Just everything you've always wanted to do, but that's the script that it was just running. Uh, we want to get that one image from Vexhost. Uh, so if I did the other thing, which is the HTTP debug logging, yeah, uh, it will do the same thing, uh, except it's going to spit a bunch of, uh, the bunch of the HTTP things. So you can see here's the actual payload that was returned from the, uh, the get image uh, call. Uh, there's there's the, the URLs that it's calling, so this is like the sort of low-level uh, HTTP library interaction. Uh, obviously, this is not a, a, a logging level that you want turned on all the time, uh, because you will not be able to read your logs. Um, <laughs> it would be completely uh, uh, useless for you. Um, so uh, there's a set of cloud regions. As I mentioned earlier, you've got to have both a cloud and a region to be able to do any operations. Uh, so in this case, to, in order to do a multi-cloud thing, I've got uh, a list of tuples containing both a cloud name and a region name, and I instantiate a cloud object uh, uh, using this, uh, this helper method there uh, that is connected to that cloud and that region. Um, then we're going to upload an image. Uh, if any of you have ever tried uploading an image to OpenStack across multiple clouds, you will know that it is very hard uh, because there are at least three different uh, ways, one of which has parts of the API that aren't fully documented um, uh, to do it, and there's no way to know which one of them that it is. Uh, but we've done all that work for you. Uh, we will figure it out uh, to the best of our ability and do the right thing. Um, I'm going to make a suggestion here that's probably controversial to a lot of people, which is that you should, if you want to do multi-cloud things, always build and upload your own base images. You can download them from a vendor that's making operating systems and just upload exactly what they've got. Uh, but the main thing is, is that otherwise you have uh, absolutely no way of knowing what the things are, and that, uh, that, that breaks down in a couple ways. You don't, it, you have to go through machinations to find what the image name is for the thing that you're wanting to run on that cloud. Uh, in fact, if you look at this example, uh, you've looked at the example in a second, uh, we'll, we'll see that. Uh, the images with the same content are named differently on different clouds. Uh, images with the same name on different clouds can have different content, uh, which is a lot of fun. Um, so if you upload them to, if you upload themselves as your base image, then you know what the base image content is, and you can manage that from that on, 
uh, for that on forward. Um, flavors are also named differently on clouds. I don't have really any good ways around this. I'm sorry. Uh, every time I think of trying to, to mitigate this problem, uh, we do have a, a, a method called get flavor by RAM, so you can express rather than uh, use this flavor name, you can, you, know, you can search for things. This doesn't always work because you can have, a, you know, can have four different uh, you know, flavors with four gigs of RAM. So if you're like, I just want a, a thing with a gig of RAM, I don't know, which one are you gonna get? I don't know. So that gets, that gets tricky. There's not really a great solution for that because there's really valid reasons for there to be different flavor names, so uh, you just kinda gotta deal with that and I can't fix that for you. Um, and so finally, we're gonna create a server. Uh, this does, uh, oh, I formatted that poorly, I apologize. So this is gonna do three different sets of actions uh, for those different clouds because of the configuration of the cloud.yaml file. On Vexhost, it's going to boot the server and wait for it to be active, because that's all it has to do on Vexhost. On Internap, it's gonna boot the server, but it's gonna give the boot call the parameter INAP 17037-WAN 1654, uh, because that's what we said was the default network in that clouds.yaml file, and then it's gonna wait for the status to be active. On CityCloud, it's gonna boot the server, it's gonna wait for the status to be active, uh, then it's gonna find the, the, the Neutron port for the fixed ID uh, for the server, then it's gonna create a floating IP on that port, uh, and then it's gonna wait for the floating IP to attach, and then it's gonna tell you that the server has been booted. Um, those things are all because auto IP is true, if you want to manage your IP address allocation and attachment, don't say auto IP equals true. Uh, it is default false, uh, because that could be a very confusing experience <laughs> for, for somebody, uh, but uh, if the thing that you want to do is, I want this server to exist on the internet, um, uh, which is probably one of the more common things if you're trying to do a workload across multiple different clouds, because probably at least some of them are public, um, then this is, this is a, a, a thing that, that helps that out uh, immensely. I don't recommend trying to manage that yourself. It sucks. Uh, and look at that. It's a demo, and we didn't even deploy WordPress. I'm very confused. Um, <laughs> So this is a, a different version of this that I can run to, to sort of show you the whole thing in action, um, that, uh, that rather than uploading an image um, uh, and rather than requesting just a, a flavor by RAM, uh, has both of those things listed out. So you can see that the Ubuntu Xenial image on these three different clouds are named those three different things. Um, all of those are reasonable names. There's nothing wrong with any of those names of, of that image. They're all clear to a human. They are not clear to a script. Um, they're not clear to automation that all of those are the same image. So, mm, you know, that's life. We'll talk about that later. Uh, but so we've just listed these out. It also turns out that just having a list of images and flavors isn't the world's worst thing. Uh, there are worse problems to have in life. So we're gonna create the cloud and then we're gonna create uh, the server. And so if I, uh, if I do that, you will see the lovely, um, uh, you'll see a bunch of lovely things going on. Uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna go check out a things, some things about networks. We're gonna get lists of images to look through them. We're gonna get lists of flavors. We're gonna create a server, and then we're gonna sit here polling the server to see when it's, when it's done and it's active, because this is Vexos, which is the thing we need to do there. Um, we're waiting while we're polling, because you know just polling with no weights would suck. Oh, and there's the server. Uh, and then we're gonna delete it because this is a demo and I don't really wanna just leave the server around. Uh, probably in your, in your uh, orchestration scripts, deleting the server immediately after creating the server isn't the best strategy for having good working workloads, but you know, I don't, you, know, you can do that if you want to. Uh, no reason why not. Uh, if you see, uh, incidentally, in some of these, some of these say like task network get subnets and some of them say like task server create. We are in the midst of a process in Shade of removing the use of all of the Python client libraries from OpenStack from Shade and switching to just making direct REST calls. Uh, you can tell which of the calls has been migrated and which hasn't by how it's logging into the debug log uh, just because of code structure. That's, we didn't do that so that you could tell that. You shouldn't need to know the difference. If you need to know the difference, then we've done something horribly wrong with transi transition, uh, but it's a, it's a thing to, uh, to point out we do that. So we've now successfully created the same server on, uh, on three different clouds uh, live in a demo at the OpenStack Summit on conference Wi-Fi even. Um, uh, it is worth, uh, is worth noting two things. Uh, there's, oh, not in that one. Uh, that's, that next slide should be after the next slide. Um, uh, there's, there's a thing in here where you see we're passing this name uh, so this is an image name and a flavor name, and we're just passing them to create server call. Uh, all of the places inside of, inside of Shade uh, where you're going to, to uh, uh, say, hey, I want to do this by a human readable string um, will match against both name and ID uh, uh, correctly. So it'll, it will find it by, it's, it's all name or ID, and it'll, it'll figure it out. Um, except on the one cloud that this guy told us about 
a couple days ago where in the flavor list uh, there are four flavors whose uh, names are the IDs of four of the other flavors. Um, <laughs> please, God, don't do that. Um, that's a terrible idea, and I can't. I mean, there's a, there is a mediation for that, however. Um, uh, so, uh, oh, I, I mentioned delete servers, uh, so you can do that. Uh, it's worth noting on the delete servers call, there's a delete IPs flag. Um, if you were having Shade auto manage IPs to attach to your server, uh, you can tell delete delete IPs, which will delete any IPs from the server that happen to be attached to it. Again, if you're reusing a floating IP across multiple servers or whatever, you probably don't want to do that. Um, but if what you're doing is you're creating and destroying servers and you don't care whether it's a fixed or a floating IP that it's getting, you just want a, a darned IP address for however that cloud decides to do it, then delete IPs is essentially the, the inverse of auto IP. Um, so you can also, in, if you're in the situation where our friend uh, with the weird flavor list uh, was, um, or you just happen to know the, that you, you know, you've got an ID and you know it's an ID, a lot of times in a config you don't know whether it's an ID or a name that you got and it's weird, um, uh, but if you know, you can, you can pass a dictionary. Um, it can have anything in it that you want to. Uh, for these, but if it has an ID field in the dictionary that has something, then Shade will know you have an ID and it will not try and figure out the ID of the resource for you because you've said, I, I'm giving you an object that has an ID field in it. Use that. Um, so Shade will do the right thing. So you can pass a name, an ID, or an object, object, a dictionary, uh, to most of the things in Shade that want to, to take a reference to some other thing and it will do the right thing for you. Um, uh, uh, related to that, it is worth pointing out that we don't return dictionaries. Actually, I lied. Uh, we, 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 we return munch objects. Yay! Um, uh, and they're basically almost exactly like dictionaries, except you can also uh, use ob object notation on them. So they're kind of like objects in JavaScript. Um, uh, so you can, you can do that. I'm not going to actually run that demo. Uh, let's, let's assume that you can read from the code that I'm going to get an image and then I'm going to print its name using both object, uh, uh, object notation and dictionary notation, and it's going to work. Uh, I would like to point out that this is pointing at a cloud called Zeta, which is uh, yet another public cloud that's in, in Norway. In fact, all the rest of the examples are on additional clouds. So by the end of uh, me running through the examples, you will have seen probably like 12 different open set public clouds uh, that all work. Um, but I'm running out of time. Uh, in fact, I'm over time, so uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to get to the interesting things. Uh, other things to, to be aware of, every resource uh, has probably all of these uh, equivalent uh, methods in it. So there's list servers, uh, which will get you the entire list of all of, the, all of the servers in the cloud. There's a search servers, which is, as you might imagine, a way to get a subset of those servers matching some criteria. Uh, there are an insane amount of ways in which you can filter that, uh, including dictionary matching, uh, FN match wildcards, and James Path expressions, if you know how to work James Path. Um, I, I think that's really cool and still haven't been able to use that in anger, but uh, it's, it's kind of neat. Uh, so there's git. Git will fail if you tell it to get server and it matches more than one server, it will throw an exception. If you think you might get one or more servers, use search. Search is you saying it's okay for there to be one or uh, more than one thing that matches. Uh, there's create server, uh, which creates things. There's delete and there's update for updating things. Pretty much every, every resource in, in the system supports those things. If you're a normal user, some of them may not make sense for you. You can't create flavors. So those will be hidden. I'm not sure there's not a slide in here, but there's, uh, uh, there's a, another. So the, the helper method for creating a cloud is OpenStack Cloud. There's also a helper method called Operator Cloud, which gets you a, uh, a subclass of OpenStack Cloud that has more methods in it that are things that we know are only relevant to operators. This is one of the other annoyances that we had in using our OpenStack clouds early on is you go do a help list on a command line thing and it would show you all of these neat things. You're like, I'd like to do that. Oh, that's an operator only command. Crap. Um, so we're trying. Sometimes you, it's not possible to, to differentiate those things in a specific way, but we try our best to, to stick operator related things into a bucket so that you have a better chance of not attempting to do something that you are not allowed to do. Uh, other, other things in Shade are all named verb noun. Uh, so there's attach volume, wait for server, add auto IP, et cetera. Uh, I've got a cleanup script in here you can read uh, uh, that just um, 
uh, cleans things up. Uh, another thing that's really important to note is we do this nor thing called normalization. Uh, so depending on what version of OpenStack you're connecting to, uh, payloads are different. Um, uh, things get renamed because reasons, uh, or, or just rearranged in the case of glance v1 to v2. Um, uh, and so we have, we have a data model that we, we commit to from Shade. Um, uh, so if it's listed in that documentation, we will, we commit that we will always return the, the values that are in, uh, in the documentation, even if a subsequent version of an OpenStack service stops returning that, we'll at least put a none in there or something like that. But we, we, that is an absolute contract for us. Um, so you can, you can do that. Uh, and so on the, on the Fuga cloud, uh, if you, if you looked at, uh, normalization, uh, it will, this is going to get a, a, a server dict and show you a normal or a, uh, an image dict. So this is, this is a normalized image dictionary. You can see we've added this field called location, uh, which has uh, information about what cloud this came from. So if you were, say, doing a loop across all of your clouds and doing a list servers and amalgamating them for each individual object, you would know how to trace it back to the cloud that it came from uh, or to the project or, or whatever. There's a few other things. You can read the documentation on that. Um, you can also pass to the cloud constructor a flag called strict. This was uh, inspired by Perl, uh, for those of you who uh, have any background in that. Um, but strict will only return to you the things that are in the data model. So if you want to make sure that you're not accidentally depending on your script in something that is not uh, in, we, we will pass through all the things we don't know about otherwise if you don't do that because we don't know what kind of backwards, we don't want to accidentally break you in a, in a, in a fit of purity. Um, but if you say strict, we, we will only return the things that we know about, and we'll stick the rest of the things into a properties field, uh, uh, so that if there's additional stuff, it'll, it'll show up as properties. Um, uh, so I've got, a, I've got another thing, uh, but I'm massively over time, so uh, you can look at the examples here. There's a utility script. This is how I found the image names uh, for, the, for the other uh, examples where, um, uh, where I just pasted image names into a list. Uh, so I just ran a simple thing that, that listed images and looked for uh, a name in it. Um, uh, we add, so servers are different, and this will probably be the, uh, one of the last things I, I can say uh, before I, I get run out of here on a rail. Um, uh, servers are tricky, right? Like servers are one of the fundamental pieces that you're interacting with as a consumer of the cloud, um, and they have some especially difficult problems uh, be because there's things like, well, you've got a server, how do you connect to it? Well, good luck with that. Um, uh, finding the server's uh, uh, public IP or, or private IP if you're in a private environment uh, is an exercise in madness, and if you want to see how mad, uh, you can go read the code that's in the shade slash meta dot pi, uh, and after that, you'll probably gouge out your eyes with a, with a, with a stake, because um, uh, it's, it's some bad stuff. Uh, so but we do a few things. We add some additional information. We add a field called interface IP, which is best we can tell the, the best IP you should use to connect to the server. Um, there are ways to influence how it picks that in, in config things, uh, but it will do things like auto-detecting if your current execution context has routable IPv6 connectivity, and if the server has IPv6, and if so, it will put an IPv6 address into that. Look at this, we're re-implementing DNS, except uh, client-side in Python, because we don't have DNS as a first-class citizen in our compute service. Um, uh, but anyway, we do our best to do all of those sorts of things. Uh, we also... Um, uh, Nova's address metadata can get out of sync, um, uh, especially in several of the releases that are out there in the wild, uh, and so it's just, it's stale. And so you get, you get failures spinning up and waiting for a server because the, the part of that waiting for a server is, does this server actually have an IP address? Uh, did, did, this, did this boot with any connectivity at all? As so you get these servers back with an empty addresses uh, dictionary, um, but it turns out that it has IP addresses, uh, and they're, they're fully functional. It's just that Neutron's managing them, and Nova's behind. Um, so we give up on Nova's addresses dictionary, and we query that directly from Neutron, and we overlay it onto the, onto the Nova server record for you. Um, uh, there's a few other things we do. Uh, those do result in extra API calls. Um, so if you are, if you're particularly sensitive to that for whatever reason, uh, you can, uh, there's a couple of flags that you can turn them off. Uh, there's sort of basically three levels. There's, there's uh, regular, which is detailed. You can turn detailed off, um, which will not add additional information, but it will fix stuff that we know is broken to the best of our ability, so we minimize things. Or you can say bare, which says, please, for the love of God, don't make any other calls. I don't care. 
Um, and we use this, in fact, inside of Shade a lot, like things where we're just grabbing a, a server to do something else with it, and we know we're not going to be looking at any of that information they'll be looking for, uh, then, um, then we can, like, polling if a server is ready. Guess what? You don't also need to ask Neutron what its, what its addresses are if you're only going to be looking for the status field uh, in, in the poll loop. So, uh, so that's the thing. Um, so those are some examples, but you can look at that. Uh, we throw exceptions. They're all subclasses of a, of exception called OpenSat Cloud Exception. So you're always safe to catch OpenSat Cloud Exception. It will catch any, any exception that we throw other than, uh, we, we do, uh, we, it is part of our API that we consume Keystone Auth for, the Keystone Auth library for the HTTP interactions. So there are, are some possibilities that Keystone Auth could throw an exception, and we don't hide those because we're, we're okay with that being part of our, our public interface as well. Um, those are mostly authentication related, like you didn't provide a password, you ninny. Um, those sorts of things might be key enough. But for the most part, opens that cloud exception will get you. Uh, for REST calls that we're making directly, um, uh, there's, there's a subclass of opens that cloud exception called opens that cloud HTTP error, which also subclasses requests exception HTTP error. So it has all of the features and functionality of the requests exception stack. Uh, but if you wrote code for Shade before we were doing REST calls and you were catching OpenSat Cloud exceptions, you will still catch them, um, which we thought was pretty good. Uh, you can inject a user agent information uh, into, into the thing. So if you're writing an application and you want that to show up in the, in the user information, so this example uh, uh, works with Data Centered, uh, which is based out of Manchester. Um, and if you do, uh, uh, it's a sort of simple thing that was added recently to, to Keystone Auth, but if you do that and you look at the HTTP interaction, you can see here that uh, we're showing my amazing app, that's in the user uh, agent string, also OS client configs version, and shade, and Keystone Auth, and Python requests, and CPython, all get, all get uh, put in there. If you don't add something to the user agent, all of those things will still be in there, but amazing app slash 1.0 will not be in the user agent string, if that's important to you. Um, uh, uploading large objects, if you're uploading objects to Swift, Swift has a max file size. Uh, it's expressed in the, in the Swift capabilities that you can get from the Swift capabilities URL. Um, and if you want to upload a file that is larger than the Swift max file size, you need to split it into chunks and upload it as a Swift large object. Uh, there's two different ways to do that. Um, uh, we hide them all behind the create object call. So if the file is big, too big, we will automatically split it into, uh, into chunks for you, and we will upload them in a multi-threaded fashion. Um, uh, so uh, if you uh, want to see, um, oh, so as far as the demo goes, I can't really show you that because the default uh, uh, max file size is five gigs, and there's no way that I'm going to upload something larger than five gigs. You can also explicitly specify the segment size to the create object thing, and that is the size that it will, it will chunk whatever you're uploading into. Uh, there's also a flag. Uh, a static, there's a static large object and dynamic large object. If you know enough about Swift to care about which one of those you're doing, uh, you, can, you can request them. Uh, if you don't do anything, it will just make a static large object for you. One of the features of a static large object is when you go to delete the, the logical object that is referred to as by a static large object, it will delete all of the segments, whereas with a dynamic large object, you kind of have to clean up behind yourself. So, um, uh, so we, we default to the thing that will delete all of the things when you think that it's going to delete all of the things, since we magically made a large object without telling you, um, uh, is the general uh, thing there. Uh, on, uh, on KISS Cloud, I could show you that KISS Cloud here has the network surge. So KISS runs Neutron, uh, so the, the has service call and shade will tell you. For the most part, we feel that you shouldn't need to make those types of conditionals in your code, otherwise we're not doing something fully right. But if it's like a, hey, I'm doing a thing and I want to do some analysis of whatever and knowing beforehand if the cloud has Magnum or not, because uh, more clouds have Neutron than Magnum these days, uh, there's an API call that will, that will do that. And that, that both looks in the service catalog and but also honors if you've done an override in your config. Um, so you can override those uh, uh, here and show just in the thing you can say has network, uh, and I am picking on Rackspace in this case because they put Neutron into their service catalog, but you as a user can't actually talk to that API, so service discovery will let you believe that there is a network service there, but is in fact lying. Um, uh, so that was actually the reason we added that feature, um, is so that a user could put in their config, nope, nope, I promise this cloud doesn't have Neutron, I know it says it does, uh, it doesn't. Um, so that uh, is a way to override that. Uh, and that's, wow, we actually, uh, I only went over by 20 minutes. That's exciting. I'm sure the next person loves me. Uh, so these are the, these are the, the sort of are coming soon. We're almost done with 
uh, with the restification process, which incidentally has taught me that the OpenStack REST APIs are actually way better than they're getting credit for. Um, uh, the Python client libraries make everything harder. Uh, most of the code has gotten much cleaner since we've ditched the Python client libraries. Uh, I, I highly recommend that if you're not going to use Shade uh, and you're not going to use the OpenStack SDK, just use just use REST calls. Uh, it's, it's, there's a couple of places where it's a little bit squirrely, but, uh, but in general, uh, there's some real rich features that are available there that get hidden by the, by the, the client libraries, which is pretty terrible. Um, uh, we're currently working on specking out for all of OpenStack the right way to, we, we need to, we do full version discovery for images and uh, volumes, because we have to. Um, and we have to do special things for those. Um, but. Uh, that has led us to realize that there is absolutely no documentation for API consumers on how version discovery works in OpenStack, uh, and certainly no documentation on how it should work. Uh, so we're working on a document right now, which is, this is how it works. Anybody implementing a thing in any language can implement this, and you'll get it right, um, and then hopefully move that forward to something that works less complicatedly. If you want to read something that's really complicated, go read that spec in the API working group. I don't recommend reading it. It's, 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 pretty, it's pretty wild, but we're hopefully going to get that implemented very soon, because I need it, um, uh, because that's a precursor for being able to consume microversions in in the services that are that are uh, that provide microversions, you have to be able to do version discovery to figure out what the microversions available are, so that you can do the things. Anyway, uh, so we'll get microversion support in soon. There's a talk tomorrow on 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 Shade that we'll talk about that. Uh, there's a caching tier in here, which is one of the things that that a lot. It's opt in. It's off by default, but you can configure uh, it to cache a whole bunch of things using Dogpile Cache, and so you can use Memcached or Redis or whatever you want to do. Um, uh, we need to we need to, to map that to more things. Uh, there's a multi-cloud facade layer coming on, so that you could just get a single object uh, and say, hey, you know, multi-cloud object list servers, and it'll, in threads, go, you know, fetch the server lists from every cloud in your list in parallel and stitch them into a single list for you and give it to you. Just need to write that. It's not that hard, but uh, that'll be a thing that we're going to do soon. Um, and uh, also, uh, we're very friendly, and we could use some more developers' help. So if you like, if you like hacking on, on, on client consumption libraries and solving uh, interoperability problems by working around them, um, uh, we, we would love to, we'd love to have you come uh, hack with us. And thank you for listening to me uh, babble uh, entirely too quickly, and I didn't show you enough examples, and I, I blame my laptop. Uh, and something in the world of, of projectors for the, the delay there. Anyway, thank you very much.